Okay, as the audience is joining, I will um, start the meeting. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the weekly colloquium series of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. Uh, as many of you may know, our institute is dedicated to promoting research uh, for positively transforming society using artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing, IoT, and other advanced technologies. Uh, our principal sponsor is C3.ai with comp cloud computing support from Microsoft, from Microsoft. And our consortium partners are in addition to Illinois and Berkeley, which are the lead institutions, Carnegie Mellon University, MIT, Princeton, the University of Chicago, uh, the NCSA at Illinois, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and Stanford University. Uh, before I introduce uh, today's talk, I just would like to quickly run through the upcoming talks. So the next talk would be by Asu Ozdagler from MIT and Francesca Parise from Cornell, uh, followed by Zoe Rapti from Illinois, Vince Poor at Princeton, Saurabh Amin from MIT, Sanmi Koyejo from Illinois, Rai Idgani from CMU, Sendhil Mullainathan from University of Chicago and Ziad Obermeyer uh, from Berkeley, Jennifer Lescarden from Berkeley, Emmanuel Candace from Stanford and Ziv Bar Joseph from CMU. So there are also other talks and, and uh, uh, we, we will continue to have talks throughout the semester. Uh, you might have noticed that many of these talks initially at least are focusing on COVID-19 and that's because uh, uh, that, that was our initial focus in our call for proposals. But our institute is of course broader than that and we'll have uh, talks on other topics as well. Uh, let me quickly talk to you about the colloquium format. There'll be a roughly 40 to 45 minute a presentation by the speaker. And today's speaker has indicated, unlike in the past few weeks, that he would like to pause for questions during the talk. So we'll have a couple of opportunities during the talk to ask questions and also at the end of the talk. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions and you can upvote questions if you like. So if there are ones that are popular, then I'll give a higher priority, priority to them. Uh, I will read out the questions and uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible as time allows. Okay. So today's talk is on predictive and prescriptive analytics for the COVID-19 pandemic. And the speaker is a legend in the uh, operations research area, Professor Dimitri Bersimas. Uh, Dimitri is currently the Boeing Professor of Operations Research and the Associate Dean of Business Analytics at the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Uh, when I first got to know of Dimitri's work, he was doing pioneering work in applied probability and stochastic networks. His research interests have evolved, and now he works on machine learning optimization and their applications to healthcare. Uh, he has won numerous awards for his work. I'll mention just a couple of them. Uh, he's a winner of the John von Neumann Theory Prize, uh, and he's a winner of the Informs President's Award for Significant Impact on Society, both in 2019. Uh, he's been a longtime member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he has co-founded, in addition to doing fundamental uh, research, he's also co-founded several companies, Dynamic Ideas, D2 Hawkeye, Benefit Sciences, Reclaim, and Savvy Financial. So he does translational research, both which is foundational and also, it also has an impact on society by, using, uh, by, by the formation of companies and translating them into real life. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dimitri. Please share your screen, Dimitri, now you're ready. Yes. One second. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh... Yes, I can see it. Okay. Oops. Just a second, because let me first. Uh... Hi, everybody. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, so I, like many of us, um, um, my, I will tell you uh, my efforts uh, together with my group since March 16th um, of this year when uh, the pandemic occurred and we were more or less forced to be in lockdown, at least in Massachusetts at the time. And um, of course, what my work would not have been possible if it wasn't for uh, for a group of uh, 25 um, doctoral students of mine and colleagues, um, together with uh, 
a large group of collaborators, medical doctors, hospital administrations, and policy makers. Uh, so I would like to orient you, um, I would like to give you a flavor of the work, but there is a, a website called covidanalytics.io that has uh, the latest work of uh, what we have done. And, um, and this is the, the group of people um, that have collaborated. There are too many to mention it by name, but uh, um, a lot of credit goes to them. So I have three parts of the talk. The first is a presentation of an epidemiological model that we have been operating since early April that has worked quite well, as I will indicate. It's called DELPHI, uh, Differential Equations Lead to Predictions for Hospitalization and Infections. It also gives uh, some resemblance to my Greek origins. Um, so the second is about using this model for allocating vaccines, assuming they are uh, they're available uh, at a certain level of efficacy and how to can save lives by allocating the appropriate people as opposed to randomly. And the third is clinical risk models that um, have been helpful in uh, dealing with uh, the serious consequences of the, of the disease at hospitals around the world. So my first topic therefore is Delphi, uh, the epidemiological model. Um, and it's fair to say, uh, prior to this effort, um, uh, some members of my group have some uh, work on uh, epidemiological models I have not. So this was a crash course in epidemiology. And I have quickly observed that there are three important um, uh, challenges in epidemiological models, data sparsity. Typically very little data is known, especially on a new virus in the beginning, more data is known uh, as we proceed, but at least in uh, early uh, March and April, there was not a, lo a lot of data. Of course, there's human inter interventions. Governments around the world make decisions. We need to, uh, to, in to incorporate in the models and then parameter sensitivity. Uh, the, the, model, the models are highly sensitive for a few critical parameters due to it, the exponential nature of the disease. So um, th all this make for a non-trivial model. So the, the, our, the model we have uh, developed is uh, rooted in epidemiology, as I mentioned. The fundamental uh, epidemiology 101 model is called, is called the compartmental model, S-E-I-R, that basically says uh, in, its, in the abstract that there are classes of, page, of, uh, of people susceptible. These are people that are not effective, exposed, infected, but not contagious infected, which are infected and contagious, and recovered, recovered and immune. And then there are nonlinear differential equations that link these models together with some parameters that we estimate either from data or from um, uh, trial and error. Um, so that's the fundamental model of uh, that, uh, which is a starting point. We modified this model by creating uh, 11 states, susceptible, exposed, infected, but then we had also un undetected people, hospitalized people, quarantined people, recovered and deceased. So we built a model with um, 11 states. Um, these are the nodes in this graph that are linked together in a nonlinear way. Um, all of these details can be seen. There's a paper in our website, covidanalytics.io. You can look at the details um, to understand the specific details of the model. It has, in, in my view, three innovations. First, it really accounts for the under-detection of cases. It is well established that uh, there is a large collection of people who are, who are infected, they have the, the virus, but they are not detected, and we account for that explicitly. We also have, we separate, separate people that are recovered uh, or dying uh, because they have very different parameters. The parameters of the model is well established by statistical research that they are different depending on the state. And, and another new component that actually is a big component of our success is the fact that the infection rate uh, follows uh, this uh, function, um, namely that the, the gamma of t is the infection rate, namely at the function of time, uh, what is the infection rate of people? And um, in phase one, uh, the initial response uh, is uh, the awareness is uh, still low. So the infection rate decreases, but slowly. Phase two, there's a sharp decline. And uh, phase three, there are, there's a 
policy effect. And this is uh, observation from, uh, from data that we have found that the infection rate behaves in this way. So all models utilize data. Uh, we utilize data from public sources. Uh, in the US, we utilize data from New York Times and uh, the global data from the John Hopkins University database. For specific countries, for example, we have models that give you predictions for states in various countries, Brazil or um, Colombia or Peru or uh, European countries. These come from the specific countries where we need more detail. There are some parameters that are, that are fixed in, in, in constant. For example, the detection duration, as many papers have suggested, is two days. We, this is hard-coded. The percentage of patients hospitalized is also hard-coded to 15%. Uh, so there are some hard-coded parameters and some fitted parameters as part, of, as part of the fitted process. For example, the baseline infection rate is different from, from place to place. So we, on a daily basis, we utilize uh, data that we have. These are the new detected cases and deaths uh, globally. We now refit the a model using global optimization methods. This is a highly non-convex problem. Uh, we fit the, the fitted parameters, and then we update the forecast moving typically three to four months in the future. Uh, that's roughly how the model works. And uh, so there are two technical comments to make. First is that the, the parameters, uh, there are of the order of 10 uh, parameters um, that we fit in every place in the world that we have. We have uh, 130 30 countries and 50 states in the US that we update daily. So therefore this, mod this process repeats itself on a daily basis. And then on specific requests, because we have several partners, we work uh, on specific states. Then we have also additional optimizations that we run for those states typically on a, week, on a, on a weekly basis. The, the, the problem of fitting these parameters is highly non-convex and um, because of the non-linear differential equations involved, but um, we have devised uh, global optimization methods uh, that uh, achieve um, these objectives of fitting it as closely as we can in reasonable amounts of time. The, so our current process takes about three to four hours on a daily basis. If you want more sophisticated global optimization, it might take an overnight calculation. So uh, the model has been operating since, uh, 2000, since the April 1st, 2020. And uh, overall, it has done uh, quite well, I would say, in uh, some examples. Um, uh, we predicted in the very beginning, when there's not too much data, that uh, in May of 20th, the cases in the US would be 1.4 million. They were 1.5 million. On April 17th, for example, that nobody was talking uh, for Russia in a big way, Russia had 30,000 cases. We predicted 300,000 cases by May 20th, it was 318 cases. So of course, nothing is perfect, but, uh, but uh, you see some of our, our accuracies, um, they are quite reasonable in, um, in, their, in the predictions, I would say. A another topic of, of significant importance is um, the effect of lockdowns. This has been a, a controversial topic, at least in the beginning, less so today. But um, I have read in the press, including from people that are uh, quite well respected, is that uh, the lockdowns, and this is what Sweden has followed, suppose they were not imposed. Our model suggested that if they would not impose, there would be 3.1 million deaths today and 40 million in the US and 40 million worldwide. They definitely saved lives. And also it's very sensitive, the US is, is widely believed, and I agree with that, that the, the US um, was a bit late on its, uh, imposing lockdowns. Our calculations suggest if in New York, Louisiana, and Massachusetts, for example, we impose lockdowns one week earlier, there would be 80% less deaths. Um, uh, speed in an exponential increasing uh, disease, speed matters. Um, so what we would like now also to understand is the effect of policies. As uh, in the beginning, people followed lockdowns, but then, um, uh, and, and some countries uh, have uh, reimposed lockdowns. Some of them are in, uh, have no measures or restrict gas mass gatherings. So the question we would like to answer is what, how would we model a government response in making predictions in an environment that these policies change dynamically? And in our website, if you, if you look, you will see that the user can pick the place 
can select what policy they want to apply, when they want to apply it, and then you can make predictions three to four months in the future regarding the effect of this policy. And what we have found is that if uh, the policy of having no measures has an infection, let's say 100%, uh, if you impose lockdowns, you go from 100% to 24%. Um, this is historical data from around the world. If you impose, for example, a strict math governing from 100, you go to 87 and so forth. So these are historical analysis that we have, um, we have built. And the way we model the dynamics is as follows. We have this gamma t, the infection rate, which is an arc tan function. This is the function in question. Uh, so if we the way we model imposing, um, imposing uh, a, a government policy is we impose this government policy at time TC, then um, the infection rate goes up at this time. It has been decreasing all along because now, because we have uh, eased the measures, the, the infection rate goes up by the, the, how much it goes up is proportional to the numbers I gave you before. And then it continues to decrease um, uh, according to an, an arc time function. So um, for example, if you go from lockdowns to no measures, uh, unlikely, but it's possible. You, I remember the calculations one and 0.24. So the infection rate goes up by 76% of the, of the time. In other words, this, this gap is, uh, increases by 76%. Or similarly, if you go from restriction in mass gatherings and schools closings to lockdowns, it goes down by certain number. And these numbers are fixed um, and found by what the observation has been, has been in the world. Um, so, so just to demonstrate some of our current uh, predictions, our current predictions is that by September 15th, we expect 900,000 deaths. Uh, and uh, in the US, about 200,000 deaths by September 15th. Um, so the, uh, the situation, of course, would vary if um, drastic measures uh, become available. So let me demonstrate uh, for a minute the, how it works, uh, the website. Um, I'll try to share my screen again. If I succeed. Um, I hope you can see the screen. So this is how to predict the policy. I, I selected California. You can select uh, uh, a continent and the country and then uh, the particular state. You can select policies, let's say restric no restrictions, the six mass gatherings and assume everything is now, but restrict mass gatherings in four weeks and lockdowns in, let's say, six weeks and these are the effects on uh, for california predict predictions these are predictions um, for de detected uh, cases in california as a function of this policy so the blue is uh, the no restriction the red is restricted mass gatherings and this is lockdowns and this is the the fit so far the fit so far is perfect it's almost very strong uh, and these are the deaths. Uh, at least you see, or of course you can make it, you know, by, you can see exact numbers, but you see pictorially what the effects are. And the situation changes drastically. For example, where I come from, Greece, uh, there were very few cases until about three, four weeks ago. Now our models predict that if um, the situation continues, it will be a very drastic increase in Greece, which I think the, the government of Greece, in my opinion, should pay some attention. To these changes. So hopefully you have a sense of how the, the thing works. Please, if, you, if you're interested, you can experiment. It's relatively easy to experiment. Let's try, for example, uh, uh, no, Connecticut, uh, same policies, but in Connecticut. And I you will see a very different story. In Connecticut, the, you see very different, uh, very little change depending on the policy. Uh, whereas in California, Texas, and other, the Western, uh, Part of the United States and the South, it's quite different. So, um, so it's very uh, dependent on the on the place. So, I would like to stop here and open the floor for some questions before I proceed. Uh, so, there is one question, Dimitri. I guess it's a comment. Uh, maybe you could 
comment on the comment. So the comment is, I'd, I'd recommend that in the next iteration of the model that uh, use, do, do not use exposed for people who are infected. Some people are exposed and will become infected, others not. The question is from Stefano Bertacci. I'd also recommend differentiating infected people who are infectious and undetected from those who are infectious and detected, but not hospitalized. This can help you account for differences across locations for the proportion of the infected slash infectious who are identified and thus subject to isolation, et cetera. Uh, so it's, hard to, it's hard to respond to a rather complex comment, but uh, the evidence I have that these methods re work recent, uh, reasonably is um, we do experiments, we, we, we keep track on a daily basis, it's on our website, the predictions we made, we make um, for every day at the moment we make it. And uh, I hope you have a chance, including the gentleman who asked the question, to see how accurate we are or not so accurate. I'm not saying we're perfect, but uh, the models by and large have held their own quite well to the point that uh, we have been working with uh, several uh, state governments uh, as well as uh, governments around the world, and also pharmaceutical companies who, and these models are being used for guiding uh, these critical decisions, for example, where to, um, where to allocate resources for uh, trials, uh, how, what policies to follow, and uh, by and large have been reasonably successful. I'm not certain that I'm, not, I'm certain that one can improve on these things. I have no doubt about that. But um, uh, my, my uh, if a, if a gentleman could send me an email personally about specific uh, recommendations, I would be glad to follow up with that. Yeah, I think that's the question I was asked by Professor Bertacci, who's a, who will be a speaker, I think, in this series. Go ahead, yeah. Shankar. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, Dimitri, thank you for your talk. Uh, by the way, the speaker was the former Dean of Public Health, so he probably knows what he's talking about, so I'll be sure to get connect Stefano with you, uh, Dimitri. I, I, my question is, uh, you know, in this era of, uh, uh, you know, of deep learning, you know, when people see model-based methods, there is, uh, in some circles, a real temptation to say, uh, throw a big neural network at it and let it figure out the parameters. And, uh, you know, being of a model-based persuasion myself, uh, I, this is uh, not for my own unification, but if you could respond to this community, yeah, you know, uh, about why you chose this sort of really model-based yes. model approach, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, there are two reasons I chose. One is philosophical. One is uh, the state of affairs in uh, early, early April, late March. So neural networks, by and large, the, one of the reasons they work when they work is the availability of gigantic data sets. Uh, that's not the case here. Not, definitely not the case in uh, March and April. We had very little data to go for. And we had earlier data from prior uh, epidemics, uh, the Ebola and, and so forth, but very few. So I would say, I don't believe that uh, the, the state of affairs at the time uh, lent itself to, because la there was significant lack of data, and, you know, and therefore uh, it, is, it is my belief then and, and now that it might not be the appropriate method for doing it. In fact, I do not know uh, an approach, I might be, other people can inform me, but I didn't, I'm not knowledgeable of any model that has been one of the models that people use that utilizes uh, this large neural network with success. Uh, so that's the, a key component of the idea. And I, I would say this particular model we selected is uh, based on uh, research of many other people, enhanced by some of our understanding, uh, but uh, it, it makes, to, in my opinion, makes a, a trade-off between uh, a model-based approach with a few parameters that we have a chance of, of, uh, of fitting in a data-poor environment that we were at the time. Uh, thank you. So, so there's a, a question about one of the strengths of your model is to account for infections that have not been detected. Uh, however, you assess the accuracy of your models using epidemiological data that is known to underreport case counts. Can you explain these discrepancies? Yeah, our, our view is the following, is that, um, first of all, it's complicated dynamics because if you look at the undetected people in, uh, affect the other cases in a particular way, uh, the only no thing I know for sure is what governments report, what hospitals report. I would therefore like to be judged uh, this is what we are trying to predict. So I think it's not unreasonable 
even though reality might be five times higher or 10 times higher in, in places uh, because of under detection. But what we predict and what we'd like to be judged for from is what people report. That's certainly known. The, the, the undetected people, the, you know, with seriology data and so forth, we, we have some understanding, but there is not, the, the, the data on, uh, on that is mixed. The, the quality of the data, the gaps and so forth. We built a model based on to, to predict what is reported, and we would like to be judged by that. Right. I guess one. Uh, I think the answer to this is yes. I think is it a deterministic model? And and I the guess model is deterministic. The right. model is deterministic indeed. Yes. Okay. And then the next question is: Do you consider changes in testing rates when predicting new cases, or assuming testing rates are constant? T testing testing rates are. Um, um, the way we have done it is constant for the region. And, 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 and this is one of the fitted parameters. In other words, as, as data changes, we reevaluate, we re, refit, but it's constant for the region and there's a different parameter for another region, which is but reality. It but it changes over time, even for a region, because you have a model fitting. Yes, because produce. we fit it. That's correct. That's correct. And yes. then uh, Tamer Bashar has a question. Sorry, I've not been reading out the names of the uh, audience sometimes. How do you define lockdown? Is it complete lockdown? Nobody can leave their homes, no mobility, et cetera, or partial? Uh, lockdown is defined uh, as per CDC that uh, not a complete lockdown, but extremely limited. In other words, you can leave your home and uh, uh, to get groceries. That's, it. That's the extent. Okay, thank you. That was a lively question and answer session. So, okay, I will move on yeah. to the second part of the talk, namely, I uh, have to find it first. Where is it? That's the second. Finding the exact place of the PowerPoint is you need. Uh, okay. So, the second uh, piece of, of the work. Uh, that I would like to report, hopefully, is allocation of vaccines. So uh, as it is well known, the mortality rates depend on age and they have very different uh, infection rates vary within regions and vary over time. I remind you that uh, in the early stages of the pandemic in the United States, the Northeast was very heavily hit. The infection rates was extremely high then there, but uh, the, the southern and western uh, of the United States was less so. It's a very different situation today. So based on these ideas, um, the question we are trying to answer, can we find a principal framework for vaccine allocation among policy plan, for policy planning? In particular, we are, we are trying to, to ask the, and answer the following question. What is the number of vaccines to allocate to each age group in each state at, on each day? Imagine, in other words, that you have a, a, a number of vaccines available and the effectiveness of the vaccine is, let's say, 60%, meaning that uh, you protect 60% of the people. We, it's a parameter that um, uh, you protect them uh, against infection, but not all of them. So uh, rather than giving you a lot of equations that are difficult to understand online, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to minimize the total cumulative deaths in a way that, because we now have a, an epidemiological dynamical model that, uh, that can predict uh, throughout, let's say, the United States, uh, it can, of course, be done in particular states um, around the world. Uh, you have, let's, let's imagine we have a, a, a this modernized finishing uh, vaccine and then other country, other companies. Let's say we have uh, available, uh, uh, 300 million of vaccines, but they don't come immediately, they come over time. So how do you allocate them? So we, we know, that we have from the epidemiological model, the Delphi model, we have an evolution of the dynamics. We also have resource constraint. We have limited supply and we also have fairness requirements. We don't want that uh, a state gets all the, vac the vaccines and another state doesn't get any. So there's uh, some allocation, there are some bounds on the deviation from the proportional allocation. And you also have uh, vaccine limitations. There is uh, effectiveness, there are safety considerations and so forth. So we built an optimization model that makes these decisions 
and uh, on assumptions, of course, this vaccine is not yet available, so I cannot say. But let's say, su suppose you have uh, vaccines that are available, let's say on July 15, there were 300,000 vaccines available uh, per day. And, uh, and you, would, you have a period to allocate them from July 15th to October 15th. Um, if you are allocate them proportionally uh, to the population, then uh, you, you incur 8,000 deaths. On the other hand, an optimization model that, uh, that allocates people to the, at the right level. And what is the right level? And to, the, to which people? We know that um, you know, the initial uh, view of how to allocate vaccines is to get people that are more vulnerable, the older, the, the people that are in the, in the front lines of the disease, uh, pers personnel of um, medical personnel and so forth. So what instead, what this, this um, methodology does, it, it allocates the vaccines to those that are quite likely to infect others. And, um, by, and, and, and how we know that, because we have the, the Delphi model that tells you who, who are, you know, by affecting certain groups uh, and by certain age, you can then af not only affect themselves, but they can affect whom and how many they infect. As a complicated dynamics, but the optimization models can, model can do that, re resulting in a, in a sizable reduction of, of death. We have tried this, and these particular numbers assume a 60% effic efficacy of the vaccine. And uh, we allocate vaccines into age groups from 10 to 80. We don't allocate above 80 and below 10 because of the sa safety considerations that we, have, uh, we are presuming. Uh, clearly, of course, this is hypothetical, but it does, the, it, it, it does open the question, which I hope uh, the government, uh, governments around the, con the, the world address, that uh, it's not correct, in my opinion, to allocate vaccines just proportionally to the population. Knowing, uh, of course, there are, it's, a, it's a, another complicated matter, also the, you need the supply chain involved and so forth. But the key aspect to, the, to it, the key insight that I, I, I gained from this effort is, is to allocate vaccines to those that will infect others more in the future. And by doing that, you can have a, a, a somewhat material impact on the, on the allocation, on the, on the deaths involved. Let me pause again for more questions on the topic. Um, yes, yeah, so actually I have a question. Um, so so uh, you, I, in the Delphi model that you originally mentioned, you just mentioned a, a SEIR differential equation model. So I didn't quite get how you know who, who is more likely to infect others and so on. So is the model yes. more fine grained than that? There are states, um, I think, right? There, there are various states in the population. For example, and and also age uh, age distribution as well. So uh, by focusing uh, on, and we clearly know that the mortality rate depends on age significantly. I mean, uh, materially, actually. Uh, you know, we are talking. Uh, 15, 20 times difference between the low and the high. Mm -hmm. In addition, the infection rates depend on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on area. For example, if you allocate uh, in, 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 northern, in the Northeast at the moment, the infection rate is not as high as it is significantly lower than it is in uh, south, the Southern and the Western states. Mm -hmm. So um, by giving more priority to the states at the moment, um, you, so, so the, the, this is what it does. The fine grain is by age and by state. In other words, we have s uh, five um, age ranges and 50 states. You have uh, 250 classes and, and these 250 classes, you want to allocate vaccines among them. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so are there any network effects? For example, you do, do you consider migration, you know, people moving from state to state or no mobility, or, or is it just assumed that the, each state is sort of an individual yeah. entity? No, we assume that each state has its own rate. There, there are, there's no migration among them. Okay. You, we have experimented with increasing, we're having some migration. Uh, the effects are reasonably robust up to some smaller change. If, they, if there's significant migration, if significant movement in the country, then the results are not so strong. 
but up to a significant uh, level, it's reasonably robust on that. I, think I have a question, questions. if I may. Oh, uh, go ahead, Gustav. Uh, this is Gustav Spanos from UC Berkeley. Uh, if you administer the vaccines to people that are likely to infect others, which makes perfect sense, do you consider the, the possibility that uh, somebody who has the vaccine might change their behavior? And if the vaccine is only 60% effective, uh, that might have some feedback effect that cancels the, the optimization? Uh -huh. As you know, this is a tough question to, uh, to answer. The answer is no, we don't, we don't take this effect. We don't model uh, future behavior because this, you know, this is a hypothetical. We don't know if such a vaccine is available. So we don't model that. But I do believe we capture the, the effect that you mentioned, I think is an is a, is a, is a interesting and important effect. I think we try to model what I, what I consider first order behavior. That is um, the, the idea that I mentioned. Uh, but this effect we haven't modeled. So there are two questions in the Q&A box. Uh, one, the first question says, would it be better if vaccines are given to those who will be more likely to infect the vulnerable population? I guess you had already said that you're going to give vaccines to people who are more likely to infect, but I guess maybe the question is more likely to infect the vulnerable population. Should you take that into account? Um, at the moment, this is not uh, modeled directly. Otherwise, we, you need pairwise. You need to, to be able to. See, currently, we don't have, uh, you know, who infects whom. You, you only know aggregate groups and how they are infected. Perhaps a more detailed model can cover that. But uh, my my belief is, uh, and I hope this is one of my key messages: by opening the dialogue on this matter, uh, more detailed modeling can be done to. To, to, uh, to model that, we are entering an environment that these decisions need to be made. It's, uh, I hope anyway, I hope that uh, there are multiple companies that create vaccines, at least one of them will be successful. So uh, at least we open the dialogue to basically avoid proportional uh, allocation. That's the extent of my effort uh, on that. But you can do mu much more work on that. This is extremely recent work, actually, motivated by what I have been seeing in the, in the arena of vaccines. But uh, we haven't modeled that aspect. So the final question we have uh, so far is, could you explain how you define the fairness constraint mathematically? Yes, the fairness constraint is the following, uh, that, um, so somebody could say, uh, a fair constraint might be the, 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 the allocation in a particular state should be proportional to this population, right? So a population that has, let's say, five, a state that has 5 million people and another has 10 million people, the first one should get uh, one half of the second one in terms of vaccines. So relative to this benchmark, we deviate to this benchmark by less than delta. That's the, the, the first aspect. The second aspect is that on a day-to-day -day basis, week-to-week -week in this case, we, from a week-to-week -week basis, you cannot move too much the, the allocation. You can move, uh, let's say, by 10%, but not, you cannot on, on one week do extremely different from what you do in another week because the supply chain. It's not a fairness, but it's a, a feasibility aspect. You can only gradually change an allocation um, from, uh, let's say, week to week. But the fairness is what I mentioned, uh, you know, deviation you. from the population allocation. So two more questions have popped up. Uh, I think they're related, so let me read them together, one by Tamer Bashar and one by David Hunt. Uh, the uh, first question is, we know that there will be a certain fraction of the population that will not agree to be vaccinated. Can this behavior be accommodated in this model? The second question is, if people in a region are known to be more resistant to taking vaccines, would it be better to reallocate to other regions where more people will take the vaccines? I guess both questions are related to what happens if people refuse to take the vaccine. Yeah, and the model, as I indicated, the Delphi model does not have this characteristic. One could do it. The complication is uh, we don't really know the behavior of people defend, de, de, at the moment. You know, if you have, let's say, a particularly successful vaccine, let's say in the 90% range, which is not extremely likely, but assume, one would expect that the number of people who are not willing would be much less than uh, when the vaccine rate is maybe 50% or 60%. So we don't model it at the moment. I, uh, I'd, maybe in the future, in, an, in a new incarnation, maybe it's appropriate to model, but, um, but this is again, not something we have modeled at the moment. 
Thanks. Okay, so maybe you can continue now. Yeah, so my last part is a clinical risk scores. Uh, this is using machine learning to predict patient outcomes and facilitate the triage decisions. So um, we, we, this is a study that involved about 40 hospitals around the world, um, from pri primarily uh, Italy, from Italy, Spain, Greece and Germany in Europe, United States and several South American countries um, and several organizations. So what we, the question we are asking is the following. We have um, uh, definitions, we have data, electronic medical records for people who go to hospital. Um, from, from that data, we would like to understand um, as well as vitals, your blood pressure, your temperature, not necessarily detailed electronic medical records, but also there are two types of data, in other words, uh, vitals as well as uh, electronic records. From this information, can you predict whether somebody will, have, will be infected without tests, just on machine learning? Second, uh, can you predict uh, mortality? Uh, the reason this might be relevant and important questions is that to this day, our test is not fantastic. Um, tests take at least a couple of days, at least PCR tests, to get, to get il delivered back. At MIT, it takes us about two to four days to get the, the results of a test back. Maybe in other places it's faster, but I'm telling you my personal experience. Um, in some other cases, even more. Um, so can we get even an imperfect test, but as you will see, the machine learning gives you quite strong results without uh, doing a PCR test and also and prioritizing the PCR test on those that score very high on this type of infections. And then on, 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 on mortality, uh, especially in the early parts of the disease, and unfortunately we are approaching this level in parts of the country, including the United States at the moment, the resources, um, the, the healthcare system uh, is reaching its capacity. In some places it has reached it okay already. And uh, the question is how do you prioritize the sources? And the idea is to prioritize the sources where the mortality probability is highest, including also triaging. So at the triage level, when a, a patient arrives, how do you allocate resources? Which, uh, in, what, in what ward of the hospital you, you allocate the patient and so forth. So with this motivation, um, the particular, um, and then you can see far more details in our website, um, we um, try to understand uh, mortality uh, at the moment. This is what I, I chose to present. So we had, um, uh, in this particular experiment, we had about 1461 COVID-19 patients from Cremona, Italy, which is in the middle of Lombardia, where the in fact, this particular hospital where we have the data from is the, is, uh, the hospital that had the, the first patient with COVID-19 in Italy and about 1,400 patients from Spain. In that population, this was early times of the disease, the mortality probability was 25%. And we had uh, features like demographic, demographics, comorbidities, vital readings, and lab values. The lab values were optional. And we, we built uh, various models. The most successful model was um, a, 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 a trees, an, an ensemble trees model. The name is XC Boost, for those of you who know it. The accuracy of the model with lab values regarding mortality was very high, 96%, and 92 without lab values. And you see the various factors involved. Um, the, when you have uh, lab values, age, is uh, a significant contributing factor, BUN, oxygen saturation, CRP and AST, these are particular measurements in electronic records. If you don't have uh, electronic records, uh, the age is, continues to be the most important factor, oxygen saturation, temperature, gender, and heart rate. But between age, oxygen saturation, and temperature, that's a significant indication of, um, of the most important and most important factor. So at the moment, um, we, this, these particular models are being utilized in several hospitals, especially in Europe, um, where we have developed it from, and, uh, and some US hospitals that contributed to our data sources. Um, so, this, so this is the, another area, is um, outcome prediction in terms of tests, uh, positivity or not. 
Uh, and we also received data from uh, about 3,000 patients from Italy. The, 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 the website um, records data for much more hospitals now. This is just an indication. Um, and in that population, about 53% of the people had positive results. The, the accuracy is not as high as in mortality, but it's reasonably high. It's 83% without lab values and 92% uh, with lab values. Without lab values, it's similar to what we've seen before. The most important is oxygen saturation, temperature, age, um, respiratory frequency, and heart rate. Uh, and um, I'm indicating what's called subplots. The, so the lower the oxygen saturation, the higher, the higher the probability is that you have COVID. Uh, so there's some meaning to these graphs. It's not so important for the presentation. So um, we have um, um, so we have found, uh, as I mentioned, key factors. Most of these key factors agree with what the, the literature has reported. But in addition, we have created this app that you can run it uh, in our website. And in fact, multiple places around the world utilize it, especially as you uh, as people are at home and uh, you would like to prioritize the tests in environments that they don't have a lot of testing, you can use it with information that people relay to you on the phone. In conclusion, uh, I presented you in, um, at immediately at high speed, uh, three types of, um, of models, uh, enhancing an SIR model with some key real world effects that increase the accuracy of prediction. Uh, a model on uh, allocating vaccines, and then machine learning models for predicting um, mortality and infection using uh, data, either vitals, uh, uh, demographics, uh, and or using uh, lab values. So of course, uh, the group uh, being a sizable group works on other arenas, uh, but these are some of the things I thought might be of, of some interest. And if you would like to further explore, you can find in our website daily predictions. You can find uh, these uh, various things to play with uh, and make uh, experiments yourselves. All the data that we have, uh, with the exception of the medical data because of HIPAA, are available in our website, including our historical predictions and their accuracy. I thank you. And I open this, the floor for questions on this part, as well as the entire talk. Thank you, Dimitri. That was a great talk. Uh, I guess now the floor is open for questions. Uh, maybe I'll ask, uh, uh, um, start it off with a question. So early on, you talked about uh, gamma T being the infection rate. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you said that uh, as time progresses, it, it slows down because people become more aware of the disease. That's right. Uh, uh, so I have two questions there. So, so um, because, because of the awareness change, uh, uh, since gamma T is changing, uh, I, was, uh, I was quite impressed by the fact that you were able to predict for a month ahead because uh, it was so accurate because I mean, during that time, if gamma T is changing and, and uh, how would you, I mean, how far ahead can you believe these results because during this time, uh, especially in the early part. So I would say I'm reasonably confident that our three month prediction Mm -hmm. we, we typically make three months prediction from the point we are now. So at the moment, it's, let's say mid-August, mid we make predictions up to mid-November. Uh, we have found that, uh, that uh, and I would say if among all the things that uh, I mentioned, the one that makes the, the most material difference is exactly that. And, and the way also, we also model the second wave is the, you know, in some places around the world, they are the so-called second wave. Um, namely, there is a, take Greece as an example. I know Greece because I'm Greek, as you know. So in the beginning, Greece, of course, there was some initial, uh, uh, but, but it was reasonably contained. Then it opened up, and then people from other countries start uh, coming with uh, much less control, with a much more open society. And yesterday, for example, Greece has 250 cases in one day, it had maybe three, four weeks ago, 10 cases. Um, so one would say we are in a second wave environment, namely a new. So the way we do it is to say, of course, we, we, know, we don't know exactly what happened, but the way we do it, we say, okay, at some point in the past, there was, um, so if that's a parameter to search for, we go up 
uh, where the infection rate increased, again, another parameter we search from, and then it slowly, slowly goes down. So this adds two new parameters in the overall estimation process, which we estimate, and this is how we account for, for um, this second wave uh, aspect, which we, what we have found, we have lots of data to suggest that um, predictions we've made three months ago, because now we are in mid-August, we start making predictions in April, we know our accuracy. And I would say, while not perfect, we have been quite accurate. And all, all of this you can find on our website, how accurate we have been and where. So, but this is an important component. I mean, a behavioral aspect of how people re react. So, so following up on that, so you suggested that gamma t follows an arc tan function. Yes. So, is that yes. a well known? No, no, this is, not, this is our own uh, approximation. I mean, don't, okay. there's no physical, it's not a magical <laughs> okay. uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, okay. It's just repeated various things. And we, you know, I, I think uh, Sarkar mentioned low, you know, low dimensional modeling. This is an arctangent function that has the behavior that we think is correct with one or two parameters. Okay. I mean, there's nothing magical about it. I, okay. I have no theoretical reasons to believe that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So are there any other questions? I guess there were a number of uh, questions. I, I'd like to, uh, Dimitri, that, uh, this time I have a question about modeling. So, you know, these SEIR models, of course, a hot topic of discussion is, you know, they're deterministic models that come as sort of a mean field approximation That's right. to stochastic uh, interactions. Yeah. And I was very struck when you said, uh, you, you know, particular populations that are susceptible and so on. So tell me, what is the role that you play in perhaps uh, adding some stochastic element to the mean field models to take into account that sort of interaction dynamics, or, or, or maybe it's not feasible, but anyhow, uh, I just mean, to be honest, your thoughts. I have, I mean, as I mentioned, um, the, 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 this effort, uh, was uh, this is research under pressure. Huh? So mm -hmm. it's not that uh, it's a long-term project. I mean, I, I literally started working on this April, March 16th when I, was, I found myself locked in my home. So oh. that's how we started. So it's not that I thought, uh, you know, develop the most general, exciting model to do research. I was thinking, what is going to happen in the world? <laughs> so just to mention the motivation. Huh? So to me, so this is an environment, this is, this is epidemiology, all of us are familiar with the R0. R0 is, is a very critical, you have exponential growth if R0 exceeds one, and you have distinction decline to zero if R0 becomes less than one. So that's a very non-robust story. I mean, you know, a little parameterization. So it is possible that you can improve with stochastic dynamics and so forth. But given the time we have, given our understanding and so forth, this is a choice we made. It's, it's not I'm trying to convince you that this is the best thing after Swiss bread, because it isn't. But, but I think it's a pragmatic, a reasonable approach that at least some organizations in the world use it because it has proven itself to give reasonable answers, useful answers for, for the phenomenon. I mean, as we have more time and the luxury of becoming more retro retrospective on what we have done, perhaps adding some stochasticity might improve things. But I, I honestly believe, Sarka, it's not a first order effect. I don't think uncer the uncertainty <laughs> is a first order effect here. In some cases it is, but I don't think it is. Okay, very good, thank you. Sure. So I think that talk. wonderful talk, wonderful yeah. project, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I think the next question is something you might have already answered for uh, based on Shankar's question, which is, what do you do regarding uncertainty quantification within Delphi? I guess the answer is you are not doing anything for. We are not. Uh, as you do notice, that's not typical for my answers, but right. but the case here is that, you know, when you have to act fast, you make modeling decisions. You make decisions because if you don't. You have analysis paralysis, and therefore you don't proceed. So I'm not certain we've done every decision on the modeling side the best, but but I, I'm not displeased with the results we have had. Great. But it's so, fair so to say that there are many areas of improvement. Okay, <laughs> of course. So the final question is from Siddharth Sadpati. It says that data for infections seems to be discrete, like infections reported per day, but the yes. SIR models are in continuous time. How do you handle that? Again, I consider this uh, discrete versus continuous time a second order effect. In other words, uh, I consider a model successful in this case if you are, let's say, within 10% of accuracy. Uh, you know, I'm not looking for having, you know, half a percent. And, and our models are significantly less than 10%. If we are about 
8% accuracy for deaths and about 4% on infections, historically. So pretty okay, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I would say utilizing, uh, discretizing time, it would make this story far more complex computationally, and it's already complicated. Right. We, we basically have, uh, we apply ne you know, next to nuclear weapons to, to, you know, we run computing time, Just, you know, the MIT computers are in <laughs> very hot because of our computations daily. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, again, uh, this is an area that requires possibly further attention, but uh, given the time, we have not looked into that. I think the question is not asking whether the model should be discrete, but the question is, since your model is continuous, but the data you might get is discrete, how do you estimate your parameters from that? I see. We, we estimate the parameters. We make, um, so, so we have an optimization model. We say on a particular day, time t, it might be discrete, but time t, we have observed, let's say, 778 cases. Uh -huh. okay. We want our prediction minus 678 squared to be as close as possible. Right. And then we pick uh, particular days, you know, the discrete aspect of that. I mean, one could do more, I mean, can integrate it, but you know, this is what we do. Because we, the only thing we know is what happens on a particular day. This is where governments announced. Right. Right. That's what we do. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk, stimulating talk, with a lot of questions. Uh, let's thank Dimitri again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to hope and to see all of you next week's uh, seminar by Asuos Dagler and Francesca Parise. Were you going to say something? Uh, no, no, no. Next, yeah. week is, uh, next week is Moshe Vardy. Oh, sorry, Moshe Vardy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, my, my, my yeah, bad. I would like to yeah. say for those of you who did not ask a question or a new question appears, or please send me an email and I promise I'll try to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Dimitri. Bye. Bye. Bye.